Hi, and welcome again to my videos for Physical Chemistry 2. The last time we met, we looked at the rigid rotor model of diatomic molecules, and we used it to predict the energy needed to excite a molecule to a higher rotational state. One of the things we found out is that rotational energy is quantized, meaning that the rotational energy of a molecule can only have certain discrete energies. The energy can't have just any value, which is what classical physics predicts. We can see this when we look at a rotational spectrum like this one. There are distinct peaks rather than a broad, wide peak that covers the whole plot. If we look at the equation for the rotational energy change, we can see more evidence that the energy is quantized. The equation includes the constant j, which is the number of the initial rotational energy level of the molecule. J is an integer, so the overall energy change can only have specific discrete values. Now that we've examined the rotational energies of molecules, let's look at another form of energy that molecules can have, vibrational energy. As you probably know, atoms that are connected by a bond vibrate as though they were connected by a spring. If you've taken a physics course, you might remember that an idealized spring that doesn't experience air resistance or friction is called a harmonic oscillator. The harmonic oscillator model is different from the rigid rotor model in some interesting ways. First, recall that the energy of the rigid rotor is entirely kinetic energy and not potential energy. But the energy of the harmonic oscillator consists of both kinetic and potential energy. If you think about how an oscillating spring works, you can see why this is the case. When the spring is at rest, it has an equilibrium length. Under this condition, the potential energy is at a minimum. However, when the spring is stretched or compressed, the potential energy increases. That's why it attempts to go back to the equilibrium length, where the potential energy is lower. Meanwhile, if you watch the spring as it vibrates, you can see that when the spring gets to its longest or shortest length, it very briefly stops as it switches directions. Because it stops, the kinetic energy is zero at that point, and as the spring stretches or compresses, it goes faster and faster, so the kinetic energy increases. The kinetic energy peaks just as the length of the spring reaches its equilibrium length. And after that, the speed decreases, so the kinetic energy goes down. So, overall, the potential energy increases as the kinetic energy decreases, and vice versa. The same thing happens when two atoms connected by a bond vibrate. The potential energy is a minimum at the equilibrium bond length, and is a maximum when the bond is stretched or compressed. We call the equilibrium bond length L0. Or at least that's the picture that we get from classical physics. However, as we've seen with the rigid rotor model and the particle in a box, the energy of the harmonic oscillator can't have just any energy. Instead, the energy is quantized, so only specific discrete energies are possible. As we'll see in a moment, that results in some behaviors in molecules that we don't see in large-scale systems, like bouncing springs. According to classical physics, the vibration of a harmonic oscillator is given by this equation. In this equation, x is the distance to which the spring has been changed from its equilibrium length. So, if the length of the spring at any given moment is called L, that means x is L minus L0. Meanwhile, k is a constant called the force constant. It describes the stiffness of the spring. A spring that's very easy to stretch or compress would have a low force constant, and a very stiff spring would have a high force constant. You're probably familiar with springs like these. For example, a slinky is very easy to stretch, so it has a low force constant whereas a spring like the one in a car's shock absorber is a very resistant spring to stretching. That's why it takes the weight of a car to make it vibrate. If you've ever had the chance to try to stretch out the spring of a shock absorber by hand, you know that that's almost impossible. 
Now, if we consider two atoms connected by a vibrating bond instead of a spring, we need to make one small change to this equation. The two atoms on either end of the bond may be two different elements with two different masses. So instead of m, we need to use mu, the reduced mass. If you watched video 11, you already know that the reduced mass is given by this equation. It turns out that this differential equation is in a form that has a well-known solution. And if you take a course in differential equations, you'll probably learn about it. The solution to the equation is this. In this expression, the constant omega is equal to the square root of k over mu. But look at that solution for a moment. It's really just a simple cosine wave with a frequency equal to omega. One thing that's important to notice is that omega is measured in radians. That means it's equal to 2 pi times nu, where nu is the vibrational frequency that we'd see in a spectrum. So what can we do with this expression? Well, it turns out that the total energy of our harmonic oscillator, that is, the combined potential and kinetic energies, is equal to 1 half ka squared. But wait, we know that when the bond is stretched or compressed to its maximum amount, the energy is all potential energy and not kinetic energy. But we already have an expression for the potential energy, which you probably learned in your very first physics course. The potential energy is 1 half kx squared. So now we have a pretty good sense of how the potential and kinetic energies of a harmonic oscillator change as it vibrates. Now let's use some ideas from quantum mechanics to try to make our model more appropriate for a microscopic system like a molecule. As you might recall from several earlier videos, in order to find the energy of a quantum mechanical system, we use the Schrodinger equation, which is this. To make this a bit more specific to our harmonic oscillator, let's make a few changes. First, instead of m, we'll use the reduced mass, mu. Also, remember that v in the second term is the potential energy, and we just saw that the potential energy is equal to 1 half kx squared, so we'll plug that into the equation. Once again, the differential equation we got has a known solution, and it's this. Notice that the term in parentheses is v plus 1 half, where v is an integer from 0 to positive infinity. Because v can only be an integer, that means that, just as with the rotational energy, the vibrational energy can't have just any energy. Instead, it's quantized. Let's plot those energies. In this plot, the potential energy is on the y-axis, and the x-axis is the bond length, L. There are a few interesting things to notice about this plot. First of all, notice that the energy level increases as we go up, where the v equals 0 level is the lowest, and the other levels increase in energy as v goes up. That makes v equals 0 the ground state, and the other vibrational levels are excited states. But wait, notice that the v equals 0 level is not at the very bottom of the curve. The curve represents the potential energy predicted by classical physics for the various possible bond lengths. According to classical physics, the potential energy should be a minimum at the equilibrium bond length, but quantum mechanics tells us that the energy will n actually never have that minimum value, because the potential energy when v equals zero is the lowest energy possible. The energy of the v equals zero state is sometimes called the zero-point energy. Another important thing to notice about this plot is that the width of the line for each vibrational state shows us the maximum and minimum bond lengths that the bond will achieve at that energy, according to classical physics. But notice that even in the lowest energy state, where v equals zero, the bond is expected to vibrate between these two lengths. In other words, even in the lowest possible energy state, 
the bond never stops vibrating and settles down to its equilibrium bond length. Instead, a chemical bond always vibrates, and that's true no matter how cold we make the temperature. Now, let's think a bit about the wave function for our harmonic oscillator model. Finishing the wave function for this model is a challenging mathematical problem, so I'll just show you the end result for now. Here it is. This expression has several parts. First, notice that the exponent includes the constant alpha, which is equal to the square root of k times mu over h bar squared. And v is a normalization constant. You might remember from video 3 that the probability that the system has a location somewhere in space must be equal to 1. And the normalization constant is a constant we include in the equation of the wave function in order to make sure that that happens. In this case, the normalization constant is 1 over the square root of 2 raised to the v power multiplied by v factorial and all times a over pi to the one-fourth power. Finally, hv is called a Hermite polynomial. Hermite polynomials are a group of functions that depend on an integer, in this case v, and they appear in many different applications in physics and mathematics. They were discovered by the French mathematician Pierre-Simon Laplace in 1810. Laplace was interested in many different areas of physics and mathematics, and he developed one of the first complete theories to explain the tides, and was even the first person to conceive the idea of a black hole. Anyway, when we plot the wave function for different values of v, here's what we get. Here again, there are a few interesting things to notice. First, note that the wave function does not reach zero at the edges of the parabola. Instead, the wave function slowly approaches zero as we go to the left and right, but it never quite reaches it. That means that there's always a small probability that the bond length will be shorter or longer than the maximum and minimum lengths predicted by classical physics. Next, look what happens when we make a plot of psi star psi for the different values of v. As you might remember from video 3, psi star psi gives us the probability of finding the system at various points in space. As you can see, the plot for v equals 0 shows us that the system is most likely to have a bond length toward the center of the parabola. The probability of having a bond length near the short or long ends of the range is fairly small. However, you might notice that as v increases, the probability at the edges of the parabola rises and the probability toward the middle decreases. If we were to continue the plot for even higher values of v, we'd see this trend continue. The probability would get even higher at short and long bond lengths and would be lower in the middle as v increases. But that might be a surprising result. It's telling us that at low values of v, the equilibrium bond length is the most probable one. That might seem intuitive, but it's actually exactly the opposite of what classical physics tells us. Remember, as we saw when we looked at the vibrating spring, the system has a high kinetic energy near the equilibrium length, so it's actually moving past that point very quickly. That means it spends very little time at the equilibrium length, so according to classical physics, it's actually the least likely place for us to find our system. On the other hand, the system slows down when it's near the long and short ends of the stretch, so that's where it spends the most time. As you can see in this plot, the lowest energy state tells us that this is exactly the opposite of what actually happens. However, as the energy level increases, the system behaves more and more like the predictions of classical physics, with the most probable bond lengths being near the extreme ends of the range. This is actually something that we've seen a few times before. The higher the energy of our system, the more it behaves the way we'd expect from classical physics. It's mostly in low energy systems that we see the wave-like nature of matter becoming noticeable, and that's what's happening here for low values of v. 
Let's wrap up for today with a quick review of rotational and vibrational spectroscopy. As we saw in the last video, a change in rotational energy is given by this equation. And the value of j can only change by plus or minus 1. The energy change usually requires a photon from the microwave region of the spectrum. Meanwhile, a change in the vibrational energy level requires an energy given by this equation. Once again, the energy level can only change by plus or minus 1, and this time the energy change requires a photon from the infrared region of the spectrum. Well, that's enough new material for now. When we meet again, we'll look a little more closely at the vibrations that can occur in molecules, and we'll see that there's much more that can happen than just simple stretching and compression of a bond. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week.